Okay, we are underway. Hi folks, Tony here from Trivatical. Welcome to today's panel discussion, the future of travel in a post-COVID world. Uh, for those of you who joined us last week, we have, uh, as you can see, a fresh panel this week, and I will introduce you to them all very shortly. Before I do, though, just uh, for those of you who are out there in the big wide world watching and listening, just jump into the chat box, please. Uh, just let us know you can see and hear us okay, and let us know where you are uh, joining us from. It's always interesting in these sorts of events to see where in the world people are and uh, where and whereabouts you're joining us from. So while you're doing that, with no further ado, I'll introduce you to our guest panellists. I thought I'd get organised this week. I'll actually take a screenshot of your bios so I don't make any mistake with reading them. But of course, my camera's died in the meantime, so just give me a second while I find each of your bios. Ah, oh, look. Don't you love technology when it doesn't work for you? Now my phone's dying on me. That's all right. <laughs> I'm going to wing it. But you guys can jump in with your own introductions. So firstly, we have Amy Rutherford um, who, with her partner Tim. Uh, uh, fire exponents and something of minimalist travellers. Uh, these guys have been on the road since this year, but they have considerable experience of travelling and uh, minimalism. Uh, and their website is gowithless.com. So welcome, Amy. Good to have you there. Thank you. How was that? Nailed that one, didn't I? Next Perfect. up, Peter Pexon from Pexon.com. Peter and Karen are long-term travellers. They've been on the road now for nearly seven years. Uh, house sitting has been something of their specialty. And they've seen a considerable amount of Asia and Australia and Central America during that time. So uh, Peter is joining us from Calgary. Hi, Peter, how are you? Fantastic, happy to be here. Amy is joining us from New Orleans. And lastly, but by no means least, Jodie Burnham. Jodie and her wife, Nat Smith, have been long-term travellers. They've been a, a, uh, the original founders of House Sitting Academy uh, and uh, now experts in roaming income for those who are on the road. So their website is natandjodie.com. And Jodie is uh, the one out of uh, the fish out of water at the moment, joining us from not her home country of Mexico. Hi, Jodie. How are you? Good, good. No, my home country isn't Mexico. It is Australia. But uh, yes, I'm in Mexico. <laughs> well, I've probably worked that out City. from the fronty accent. So let's just say hi to a few people. <laughs> we've got a Jackie Duche. I think I've pronounced it right, Jackie. I know we've had a question come in from you today, so we'll deal with that shortly. Um, from Winchester, Ontario. We've got Barbara from Denver. Uh, Josie from Josie and Connor from Michigan, Linnell from Chicago, Helen and Karen from Perth in Australia, Beverly from Fountain Hills, Arizona, uh, Noel Douglas from Vancouver, Sharon Bowater from Cuenca, Ecuador. Oh, you sound like you're an expat, Sharon. You'll know a lot about what's going on here. Uh, Paul from Queenstown and good old New Zealand, my home country. Cheryl from Colorado Springs, uh, Matt from the Central Coast, New South Wales, Kath from Victoria. We've got heaps of people. I don't think I'm going to get through you all at the moment, uh, but a good crowd. Havana, Cuba. Wow, that's cool too. Michelle from Corpus Christi in Texas. Uh, so welcome to all of you guys. I'll give some of the rest of you a shout out as we go, but let's get underway. Uh, as we said in last week's discussion, these are unusual times we are in, something that none of us probably would have expected six months ago. I'm gonna start with maybe the hardcore question that nobody can really answer. And if any of you wanna jump in first, by all means do, but when do you see us traveling again? Amy, what, what's the feeling in the States in terms of that? Well, we keep being, we try to have hope, but we have canceled our travel plans through November and that sees us heading to Asia for five months. And I, we're still real iffy about that. So, so it's hard. And as full-time travelers, we're just trying to be flexible and, and that's the best that we can do. So I wouldn't have already thought we would have been grounded this long, even a month ago. So things are changing really quickly. Well, it's not just the- We're set uh, up for both. Sorry, Peter. No, I was just going to say, we're in very similar. We've we're, Everything's pretty well cancelled until November. Uh, we're set up for a house sit then. We'll see if it happens, uh, but it looks promising. But yeah, until then, just kind of floating. Travel, though, I don't think is out, depending on what type of country you're in. Like for Canada, big country, lots to see here. We'll be, our plans are looking like we're going to be doing some internal domestic touring around the areas that we haven't been to before in Canada. I mean, to me, it's take advantage of it. It's a great opportunity to... Uh, see some of the local sites as opposed yep. to heading international. Well, I think there will be a spin-off domestically. I mean, there may be international flights delayed. The feeling here in Australia and Queensland um, is that we're not going to be going out anywhere anytime soon. And in fact, in terms of coming in here, um, the Premier of Queensland, who's the equivalent of a state governor, uh, said at the weekend that she doesn't see tourism coming to the Gold Coast in Australia for 12 months, uh, which is a huge hit because the Gold Coast is basically Australia's Las Vegas slash Miami. So it's, it's going to have a major economic impact. Um, Jody, you're um, stranded in Mexico. Do you see yourself getting home anytime this year? 
Um, home is wherever I am. So we definitely did not have any plans on heading back to Australia. I will need to go back in 2021 to renew my passport. Um, so those plans are still probably going to happen for probably this time next year. Uh, but it would only be for a quick trip. So there is no home. Our home is literally wherever we are. But we were in a um, house sit in Montreal um, in March and um, we left it early with having people take over the house sit um, with the sole purpose of getting ourselves to Mexico as soon as possible, purely because we can get a, as most people can, a six month visa here. Um, so that was sort of our forecasting idea was if we don't have to do any border crossings, um, where can we get to that we can just stay in one country for six months? Um, and since being here and, you know, that's a whole other story of what's going on while we're here, but um, it looks as if it's no problem to be able to extend if needed. Um, it's not very expensive to be able to do a short term extension. And I think, um, you know, the, the local authorities are being quite accommodating uh, with that for anybody who is here. Uh, yeah. So we're good right through until pretty much uh, mid to end September. And um, there's a couple of house sits on the, the boil because obviously all of our other ones did cancel, but um, we just have to play it by year. It's still just week, week by week. It, it is. It's very much a case of making it up as we go along. So uh, actually, Jodie, I'll just jump to a question. We, we've got um, some general questions, but I had one coming from uh, Jackie Duchet or Jack, Jackie Duchette. I'm not sure if I pronounced it correctly. And this might be a good one for you to answer, Jodie. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk about the risk fear of being forced to leave a country where there is a situation like COVID-19. If you're a full-time house sitter with no permanent residence of your own, what do you do if the country you're in forces you to leave uh, because you're only there on a visa? Is this something that we should be preparing for in the future as a result of the current situation? Uh, and I think it's a very good question. Um, you know, we're probably going to find ourselves potentially in this situation again in the future, uh, and we may well be vulnerable to that, um, that happening. So I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Jody. given that you are somebody who is in that foreign country. You're obviously okay for a while now. Um, is this something that we're going to have to have a plan B when we're travelling in the future, do you think? Look, personally, I don't think that um, anything to this scale is going to happen in our lifetime again. I mean, as, as we all could probably agree that this is a once in a lifetime sort of experience um, to this level. And the way that, yeah, and but the way that it's all been responded to around the world, um, you know, it has certainly, you know, put certain things in place. Um, for me, uh, Plan B's... Um, and not something that I like to spend a lot of time focusing on because uh, I do come from the, you know, the vein of creating your own reality, your own experience, et cetera. So when, I, when it comes down to trusting intuition, which is what happened when we were in Canada, and literally, I think it was the 11th of March or something, just a couple of days after my 50th birthday, uh, you know, getting that Trump announcement was kind of like, oh, okay, this is now serious stuff. We need to take notice. Within a week, we were in Mexico and our homeowner wasn't due back until early April. Um, so those intuitive ideas of like, as they came to say, no, let's go now, let's go now. And then everything started lining up. So from that perspective of creating our own reality, everything lined up. The first house sit that we sort of organised in Mexico wasn't going to be available until mid-April. And then literally like the next conversation was we needed to get here as soon as possible to take over from a Canadian couple who wanted to get back to Canada because the homeowner couldn't get back here uh, prior to that. So that kind of like everything unravels, like every step by step unravels. Um, and the choices of countries that you go to is sort of like Mexico was familiar to us mm -hmm. and making that decision to come here as opposed to heading to Colombia where we were supposed to go, but that was where the, the house had cancelled. It was just logistics, you know, okay, we've only got three months in uh, Colombia. It looks like you could extend. It's, you know, looking as if things are getting really tight there. It's not feeling like that's the way. Mexico feels comfortable, homely. We know the routine here. We can just come here and know we've got six months sorted out. Now, as for would the Mexicans kick us out, um, you know, versus any other country, who knows? Right now, the situation is they're not wanting to have, let, um, have people come in. Um, so every sort of region is more doing that kind of, e even within this region of the Lake Chapala, we're part of the Jalisco state, 
but Guadalajara is, you know, the second biggest um, city in Mexico, and they've got a number of cases there. They're stopping people from Guadalajara coming to our tourist destination here in Lake Chavala. Um, so they're, they're trying to shut down, and even, even our little um, kind of suburb as such, we're, we're getting um, checked between the different suburbs like to go to Ahik, we're getting you know stopped on the road and if you've got your yeah, sanitizer your mask and all that kind of stuff dignity you know you need to kind of show are you living here so all of these things have come about you know a lot of people said up front to us why mexico because surely that's going to be one of you know the last places that you'd want to go to because if their medical system isn't as good and blah 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 but what we've seen happening week by week is it's just they're catching up they're catching up they're speeding up and now they're kind of like I guess having that different regime to what we have in freedom focused countries um they're, they're following it very strictly i guess you'd say wow. um so i personally don't have those kind of fears and i don't personally like to kind of do plan b thing for me a plan b of if i needed to get back to australia would just be it feels more like a, a worse nightmare um you know one of the reasons we didn't stay in canada canada was because if a house sit couldn't be found, we can't afford to rent in Canada, whereas we can afford to rent in Mexico. So yeah. from that plan B perspective, we were just using logic, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, that's all it is an issue. Sorry, Peter. I absolutely hit the nail on the head there. I mean, we were fortunate to be in Canada when it hit the fan and we're from Canada. So we were with family already and, and that is why we're able to stay here because, I mean, we're retired. I, I'd have to find a job if I wanted to stay here because the cost of living is just too high. Um, the plan B thing, that's the beauty of this lifestyle is plan B is figure it out as it comes along. Like there's, there's dozens of options out there at any time. Uh, and it's just a matter of letting go of that, that preconceived, oh, okay, we have to be in this place at this time. And, and, and it, that, that's not true. Right? If you're full time, if you're doing this full time, um we're looking at options in a couple of other countries and they're all developing countries mainly because of that reason they're just they're easier to deal with um uh, we have no real concerns about the health care in those countries i mean we're not there's some we wouldn't go to just you know out of common sense in, in a time like this but most places like mexico panama i would have no issue setting up camp and like you said if house sitting falls through it, they're they're reasonable you can rent there you can get a long-term rental and you'll do fine like it's it's not a high cost of living so it's it's absolutely doable so getting kicked out of the country uh, for us I, I wouldn't even i mean I, I can see why people would be concerned about it but there's lots of countries out there and, and they're willing to take you and your money so that's all part of it i mean i guess the secret's being able to pivot easily isn't it and I do want to jump in on a, on a few things uh, that Jody had said. So when she mentions that they go with a, a plan A and don't think of a plan B, and Peter's kind of echoed that, Tim and I are very unique. So we know that our, our friends who are in the nomadic space, the ones who have been doing it for a long time, like they have six, seven years, have that confidence to trust that plan. You don't have to have, Tim and I are on plan T now. And because we've just become nomads in January. So we don't have that. Um, confidence and a comfort to even though things have worked out we've had one disaster after another since the minute we became nomadic uh, in the middle of January without anything going right so and Tim and I I think our favorite activity is taking a two-hour walk every day and we talk about plan ZZ and that and that's like our favorite thing to do and um, and I and I and we know enough people like Jody and many friends in the community who say, oh, like you'll have that, it, you'll just get your sea legs soon enough. But imagine in your first year of being a nomad, that kind of uh, I don't know the the timidness of like, holy cow! And now we we were supposed to leave international. We didn't know when we were launching our nomadic life. We sold our house a little faster than we anticipated. Everything moved up. Everything happened really quickly. That did go great because we sold at the height of a market um, before everything fell apart. So that is great. However, we do have a uh, new leave. Now we're new nomads in this situation and we're stuck in America. And just like uh, Jody and Peter have said, this is a really expensive place. This is the most expensive place we were planning to pay for our own accommodations, but we are finding options. So just yesterday we booked something in a tourist destination for six weeks in starting June, high, high season. 
and we found something very affordable because of COVID pricing. No one is going on, it's not that no one's going, people are not going to vacation destinations, everything's still closed. And the idea of taking a holiday in six weeks is, is kind of crazy. So, so we've taken advantage of that. And even though it is very expensive here in the United States, we've still been able to stay within our budget because even though our house sits have canceled, even though we're stuck in this very expensive country, things have shifted to allow us to afford this. Yeah. Well, we know who to blame anyway, don't we, guys? I mean, this nomad lifestyle, we're perfectly fine. The Rutherfords come along, decide they want to start doing it and just spoil it for everybody. So. Well, it's, it's a Sorry. Good the and then there's one other thing. Sorry? Oh, there, there's some, one other thing I wanted to mention that Jody mentioned. Hopefully this is a once in a lifetime. However, the, I think the big challenge is we do not know if, when the end is the end. So is it the end? And then we have little repercussions coming for the next few seasons. And that I think is, so, okay, maybe it's over by our trip to Asia in November, but maybe it comes again. And now we are in Indonesia and I don't know what the rules in Indonesia will be or the terms of my visa. So that does give us major pause and concern of like our, our future plans that we have booked, including house sits in December. So you don't know when the end is the end. No, exactly. And um, I, I think it, it probably sounds, if I can chuck my sixpence worth into this, it's um, on an American audience of so five cents worth, I better get it right. Um, I think when you do this as a lifestyle choice, the idea of being trapped in a country is not as scary as you think. To people who don't do this, it probably seems quite scary, but I think all of us, had we been stranded somewhere, it wouldn't have bothered us to the extent that maybe you think. Um, I think the other thing that can be really useful at a time like this, I'm a big fan of getting a second passport. I have another passport, so does Leanne. If you can get one, it does give you more options. Um, if we had got stranded in Europe, we would have been okay indefinitely. Um, so if, if that's an option to explore for people as well. And if you're talking about plan Bs, I think second passports can be a plus. But uh, I'll just move down a few more hellos to people. We've got Bianca in Sydney, Karen from Calgary. Amy is saying hi. Oh, that's you, Amy. You jumped on and said hi. Laura from Kalama in uh, British Columbia. Ernest from Richmond, Massachusetts. We've got Larry saying hi to all. Kathy in Sydney. Uh, Jackie and Al in New Jersey. We've got Kathy from the Galapagos. Wow, that's cool. We should put you on, Kathy. You're probably more interesting than we are. Uh, Larry and Sydney. Uh, South yeah, South actually... Sydney. Uh, Donna from Tony, I just want, if I can jump in about Kathy, um, Kathy is literally stranded, stranded. Um, so oh. being, uh, they were in the Galapagos and they were due to go to mainland Ecuador, um, but that didn't happen. So um, they are now literally the last couple of people in the hotel that has actually been shut down. Um, they don't even have staff at the hotel. So um, that's a true stranding um, on the Galapagos Islands. Uh, so, yes, it might be worthwhile having Kathy chat at some stage. She's yes. still there. We're here to give you hope, Kathy. You can listen to us. We'll make you feel better about life. But there's been a few cases. I know a friend yesterday who got the last plane out of Vanuatu back to the UK. He was being stranded there for a few weeks. So uh, it's been tough. But, um, guys, what I'll do, I've got a little poll here. I'm just going to check up for our audience at home. We did this last week, and uh, hopefully if it clicks right, it's just to get a bit of feedback from you, the audience, as to what your travel plans are, um, when you think you're going to be traveling again, if you are going to be traveling again, and what sort of travel will be appealing to you. So I'll just launch this poll now. If you don't want to fill it in, no obligations. Um, but if you do, um, we'll check up that uh, on the screen, and um, we'll show you the answers as we go. And it'll be just interesting to see the feedback we get from uh, you guys as we go. Now, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat box. Um, put multiple question marks after it. We're getting lots of questions coming through um, and we'll go from there. So actually, here's a question from Kathy Wong. How did you get a second passport, Tony? Um, that's actually an interesting story in itself. I, uh, my mother is Irish. Uh, she's from Northern Ireland and she moved to New Zealand many years ago, lived on a British passport her whole life. Uh, I actually tried to get a British passport and I couldn't. Uh, did not realise that I qualified for an Irish passport, even though Northern Ireland and the rest of Ireland are two separate countries. Uh, they do actually operate on one Irish passport. Uh, and I was told by a friend I should apply. I was surprised, so I contacted the embassy here, and uh, <clears throat> they replied to me, not only was I entitled to a passport, but I'd actually been considered an Irish citizen since the day I was born. Uh, so within about six or eight weeks, I received my Irish passport, and um, thanks to that, I can live, work, and, and stay anywhere in Europe that I, uh, that I want. So there's a number of countries um, that do give you that option um, of getting a second passport. Italy is another one that's quite strong. Uh, there's quite a few European countries and it can go back as far as grandparents. Ireland is another good one as far as grandparents. So for some of you, you may actually qualify for another passport without realizing. Um, aside from that, I won't spend too long talking about it, but there are other countries that are very um, welcoming in terms of um, allowing you to get passports. Panama is one, uh, Malaysia has a My Second Home visa. 
Uh, I can see Peter waving at me. Sorry, Peter, I've got the poll box over the top of you at the moment. You want to chip in and just mention well, something like that? <clears throat> well, I was, because one of the things that was interesting is when we were coming back here to Canada, um, because we were going to be in Canada, we discovered we were eligible for uh, UK passports. Uh, Karen, because she was born there, and myself, because my father was born there, and maintained his passport until after I was born. Uh, we applied, and we, of course, we were all excited to get to Europe and take advantage of our UK passports before other problems, Brexit and such. Um, and uh, so we're, we're sitting on a second passport. We're not quite sure how it'll help. Though in looking at countries and their visa requirements, several countries, it's, you know, you can get two to three to up to six months longer visa stays with an alternate passport. So it gives you a few options there, which is, is kind of nice. And I was curious, you mentioned earlier, it was mentioned about having to go back to Australia to renew your passport. Like we, we renewed ours when we were in Bangkok um, with absolutely no problem, mind you, given that was Canada. But yeah, we, we, we had a long house sit in Bangkok and we were able to renew our passports like flawlessly with no grief whatsoever without having to come back to our home country. And I, that could be an option as well, but we tend to use yeah. these types of things as like, well, I guess we're in a couple of years, better go back and say hello to the family. Yeah. Well, okay, there's that too, yes. <laughs> Good excuse to go home and see everybody at the end of the day, isn't it? That's so true. Let's, let's talk a bit about um, the airline industry. Um, I mean, they've been hit from the very beginning with this. They were probably the first one to be seriously impacted. And we're seeing uh, planes grounded, talk of airlines that won't be continuing anymore. I saw the other day, and I haven't investigated it further, but you guys might know a little bit about it. Uh, but Changi Airport in Singapore uh, have said they're closing Terminal 2 for a period of 18 months. I don't know if they're planning renovations and it's just been sensationalised. Uh, but that would make me think that they're just not expecting traffic to pick up again in, in a hurry. So. How do you guys, um, I'll, I'll throw this maybe at you first, Amy, how do you think things are going to play out with the airline industry? Uh, are we going to see a few disappear? And, and also, more importantly, what's probably going to happen on the pricing side of things? Will we be paying more or, or less going forward? Well, because I'm in the US, I'll speak to that situation. And the government here has bailed out the airlines. Uh, it's a little bit controversial here, but it shows the commitment to make sure that the all of the airlines in the United States are available and, and stick around in the future, which is very promising. And because it's also such a huge country that we need a lot of airline options. Um, as far as the pricing, I, I did some, so in the United States, we use 9-11, um, the, the World Trade Center attacks, as a major point of like life changed here. And it's brought up regularly, not just during this period, but this is something that comes in our normal conversation for, I mean, the past 19 years of like how life has changed since 9-11. And, um, and certainly this is some, something like that. And I did a little bit of research before this call, and it took eight years before the airlines recovered from 9-11 here, uh, six years before they turned a profit. So this is a really, um, and, and that was obviously completely different, but a momentous issue for, for air travel. And I think that it's, I think it's going to have to be priced such that people will get on planes and, and instead of people just being encouraged to take local vacations, they're going to have to be uh, taking those long, long haul flights and, and also business. I mean, the business travel is such a huge segment of airline profits and people now see that this zoom is, is just taken off and people are able to do more and more business uh, from afar so between potentially business tra business travel dipping and personal travel people being a little fearful or a lot fearful um, unknown about borders opening and closing and things like that I think the only way for this to go forward is to offer steep discounts okay Jody what's your thoughts hope so um, well, my brother-in-law has actually been uh, stood down. He's a Jetstar pilot on the Gold Coast. And of course, the Gold Coast airport is not a major hub anymore. So he's been forced into uh, taking long service leave, um, which, of course, like any other person who's been stood down from their job, it's not you know ideal, but he's still getting paid at least. Um, so the future of, you know, Qantas's little sister uh, is, is definitely interesting because when it came to the Qantas side of things that we know of, uh, they had already paid out their shareholders. So therefore there is no money, quote unquote, to um, kind of pay for these extra requirements. 
So it will be interesting to see whether the Australian government does the same as what the American government has. Um, and if, Tony, you've probably got more information about that than I do. But from that kind of personal uh, connection point of having, you know, a pilot not working right now, um, yeah, he's, he's definitely a little bit on the worried side uh, about where his work is going to be in future. Will it come back through Jetstar? Will it be somewhere else? Because he was online to becoming a, a captain as well. Uh, so, yes, there's, you know, even just the growth, I think, perfect example, as Amy said, from the 9-11 aspect, the growth of the budget airlines. Um, you know, I remember the first time hopping onto a, a Copa airline, which funnily enough was the flight that we've got a credit for uh, now, and because uh, we were due to fly into Colombia. And they have given us a credit till the end of the year, which um, hopefully we'll be able to use. But the first time I flew on Copa and was given a hot breakfast, I went back in time, like on a time warp going, oh, I remember being 15 and getting onto like TAA or something or Ansett Airlines in Australia and getting served a hot breakfast. You know, like the, the changes that have happened over 20 or 30 years. Um, we're probably just going to see more and more of that and the airlines will look at how they can Ryan air us all, you know, and get us to pay for every single little thing while maybe putting that um, upfront price being a bit lower to entice people to, to travel. But yeah, who knows? I'm not an expert in this by any means. Yeah, no, there's, there's speculation here in Australia with regards to Virgin, who are probably struggling more than Qantas, are the two main airlines, Jetstar, as you say, a subsidiary of Qantas. Um, the government won't come out and say anything other than they don't want to have a one airline and no competition situation. Um, but the state government of Queensland in the last couple of days have offered $200 million to Virgin. Uh, but as long as they keep their head office here in Brisbane, keeping work going. So that'll be an interesting scenario. But you're right with budget airlines. It's something we probably see more of outside of um, the US. Uh, budget airlines a big deal in, uh, in Canada, Peter? What's, what's your thoughts on where this will head? Uh, they're, they're not huge. I mean, there's we have WestJet is the major competitor they started off as a budget airline to air canada which was the, the monopoly uh, and they've done incredibly well however uh, i happen to have some relatives who work for westjet and you know their friends and that and it's right now they're all laid off and uh you know they've just they've shut down operations they still are doing some flights i, I think they're still doing some repatriation and some domestic flights but uh it's it, it's just shut down will they be around later I, I think they will. Um, whether they're going to give deals or not, who, I mean, who knows? Well, for us, whether it's deals, that would be great. Or whether it's, oh, look, suddenly your $1,000 fare is a $2,000 fare, we're still going to travel. I mean, that doesn't change um, our, our plans whatsoever. Um, the biggest thing for us is in Canada, I don't know what it's like in the US or Australia now, but there's no refunds on airline tickets. It's just vouchers. Like we, we have vouchers for Copa to get down to Panama where we were supposed to have a house at next week. Um, and we've got vouchers within Canada with WestJet, but nobody's given refunds. Like you are, you're sitting on your voucher and uh, hopefully things will clear up until the end of 2021, I think it is the good tell. So we're hoping we can take advantage of that. That's, uh, that's interesting because in Australia, my understanding is that refunds are the legal entitlement. I think that's the case in the US too, yeah, isn't it? Not here. I may have said that you are legally entitled to refunds. Is that correct? I'm not sure because so we are big flyers with Southwest domestically and they are incredibly service oriented and we're able to get yep. refunds. But we are also big points and miles people here. We have that great uh, ability here in the United States to earn those. So most of our, inter all of our international flights are with points and miles. And so we have to, um, in order to have those points redeposited, we have to either generally we have to pay or wait until some certain time if the flight is canceled. We were very lucky that a flight to London was, we had a direct flight and it was rerouted through Miami that allowed us to cancel it and get those points redeposited without paying any penalty fee for the redeposit. Mm. So because we do the points and miles, it's a little bit funky and, and, and there's so many airlines that I, I'm not quite sure of, of all the rules and regulations, but I do know that Southwest has been really stellar and some friends have mentioned with them. Cool. Oh, I don't know. Tim, my, my husband's like talking off, off camera and I have these on. I can't hear him. <laughs> I just wanted to add, um, add in, I, I was reading um, Nomadic Matt's blog and he had sort of a really interesting article about his viewpoints on kind of post-COVID. And um, 
you know, being, being here in Mexico, a lot of the expats, of course, are always really concerned about the locals. So there's always that, that mindset that gets very addictive to, you know, how can we keep the economy going? Like, you know, as um, gringos coming in, how can we help bring the economy going? So the experience that we had with Copa was so seamless. It was a really amazing experience. Like as soon as our Columbia house had cancelled, um, you know, we got on and we realised we're coming to Mexico. We got on the the or it was just sort of emailing with them to start with, ended up on the phone with them. And then they just, without a, a breath type of thing, was like, yep, yep, here's your voucher. You've got it through until December 31st. And of course, this was, you know, still in March. It wasn't full on as heavy. But one thing that Nomadic Matt said was, if we could just all do our little part, and unless you absolutely desperately need a refund, maybe accept their vouchers, maybe stretch them for... Um, extended time because it's like okay I don't know if I'm going to take a Copa airline flight it didn't have to be from Canada to Colombia they allowed me to say if I wanted to go from Mexico to Panama they would you know uh, allow that voucher to happen um, but I don't want to go and take our 500 bucks out of Copa and put any stress on them I'm happy to kind of keep it there and if it comes to it that things don't settle down I'll reach out to them and say can you extend that voucher I mean I'll be fair to you you'd be fair to me that, I think that's an excellent, excellent point. The, the only catch there sometimes, like we have a voucher with Copa going to Panama, which is fantastic. And then the bottom falls out on that. And we have, well, that may change, of course, hence the voucher, but we have no plans of going anywhere Copa flies. The only, and the other, the only other issue, and I, I tend to like floating on the positive side of everything because negative sucks. Um, but is will some of these airlines be around? Like I realize in the United States, they're they're forking out big bucks to keep everybody afloat. I suspect Canada. I mean, we don't have nearly the amount of airlines, but I think that similar things will happen here. But if we're going into mm -hmm. South America and that, where there's smaller airlines, my only concern is, and over in the overall scope of things, the amount of it costs for an airline ticket isn't that much. It's not going to make or break us. Um, but it, it's will it be around? Because I, I, I do agree with the support the airlines because they're going to need it. It's along with everybody else who's involved in the business. Um, it's but there is a bit of concern, and I think there's people out there who don't have a lot of resources who are going. I, I can't afford to float five hundred or a thousand bucks, hoping that this airline out of Bolivia is going to stay afloat. Yeah. Uh, that's a very valid point, and um, I mean, many of them are, are giving generous extra incentives, you know, an additional 20% value or whatever to encourage you to take the vouchers. I think probably the best thing is to monitor yeah. the airline and, airline and who they are. Uh, we travel with Scoot a lot, which is a subsidiary of Singapore Airlines, which is owned by the Singapore, largely owned, largely controlled by the Singapore government. So they're less of a concern. They've just had 10 billion of funding kicked in, largely by the Singapore government. So that sort of situation I would be more relaxed about. But as you say, some of the other airlines, I think it would pay if you do have credits outstanding to check. Um, what's the strength of that airline? What funding are they getting? Uh, if you can support them, I'm, I'm with you guys. Um, definitely try to, because we're all going to need a holiday at the end of this, I can tell you right now. So we're not going to want to walk away from these trips if we can avoid it, but it's something to be conscious of. But uh, Amy, you touched on something just before, and this, um, this might play into another question. Bianca here from uh, Sydney, I think, has asked, do you think this will drive domestic flight prices up? She's asking in Australia. I mean, this might be something generally, but... Just thinking about how airlines will try and recoup this. They may be forced to discount prices uh, to get us back out there, but they may look at other ways of trying to um, recompensate themselves. We might see, will we see cheaper international flights, but maybe domestic pushed up? And the other thing maybe playing in with that, as you touched on um, airline points before, um, it's, not, it's a bigger thing in the US than it is for, for us in Australia. I don't know about you, Jody. I've, I've never got my head around getting that to work versus jumping on a budget carrier. For me, in our part of the world, it, yeah, you're agreeing, it, it works best being on a budget. But I know in the, in the States, it's a big thing. So are we gonna start seeing those points being worth less and less while they're trying to give you something on one side and recoup on the other? What, what's your guys thinking on, on how the airlines would play that? Well, I might, if I had a crystal ball, what I'm going to think is the, it's the incidental fees. So the extra bags, the uh, picking a seat, things like that. And uh, because again, there, so after 9-11 here, they had to have massive, massive price discounts in order to get anybody on a plane again. And, and there were all these built in security measures that had changed very fairly quickly and they still needed to, so the, I think the pricing is going to have to lead this. So um, as a matter of fact, we have sometimes more, 
our the domestic flights can be more expensive than the international flights. Sometimes we get these really great deals on Norwegian or something. Um, so we fly, I mean, all over and and we see this, there's these killer deals that have been happening way before this in the past year, just all over the world. And uh, I mean, gasoline is cheap. And so, so I, I don't know that the domestic versus international is going to be, I think plane fares will need to be cheaper. And same with cruises. I think the way to get people doing things you don't want them to do, they're going to do things for price. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a couple of interesting things. As you say, fuel will get cheaper and that's going to help. And the other thing I think might get interesting is what's the uh, airport's going to charge for gate fees. They might start cutting some deals on that. Uh, they've already had to relax the rules on forcing them to, to bring their planes in because I think most of the airlines had to park up at those gates 80% of the time or they'd risk losing them. Um, in Europe, they've now wiped that rule. The governments have said you can't make them do that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens here. It might make it easier oh. to cut some deals. But Amy, right on cue, you've led me across to the next question, which is cruising. <laughs> Who wants to go cruising at the moment? Anybody? Tim, anybody? my husband. My husband, he's, yeah, so he, we, we just got off a cruise in January and we get these killer deals in email from that cruise line, Norwegian, and he's, I mean, we got sick on the cruise, so we might have even had COVID on that cruise. And he, it's, it's crazy, I mean, there's a price for everybody and we're kind of frugal and that has, my crazy husband says, I'd be up for it in a few months. I, he, he, I think he'd be going alone. With, I, he might be the only one on the boat, but I, I don't know that I'd be on there with him. <laughs> well, he'd be safe then. Jody? <laughs> oh, look, um, I recently did um, this um, Enneagram. Some people know what the Enneagram is. And basically, it sort of like helps identify your motivations. Um, and there's nine numbers and everybody has different motivations. And they put it, there was a thing that went around the internet saying, here's what all the numbers do in COVID. And my number showed up saying, I'm looking for that cheap cruise deal ready to go. So, so maybe I'll be going with Tim, Amy. So <laughs> sort of throw If you and Nat go, wind, maybe I'll think. go. But, but I might go again. <laughs> it's, it's kind of using that non... <laughs> it's, uh... Well, I need to check Nat's numbers. I don't know that she was necessarily... A com if I'm back... From, uh... um, Sorry, there's a comment here from Kathy Hannish. I finally get a free drinks passage on a repositioning cruise and this happens. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind, Kathy. That they might be shattering. Uh, but the cruise, cruise industry is going to be an interesting one, actually. And, and it's probably a good time, actually, to pop the answers of our poll up to you guys because um, we've had most of the answers come through. And I'll just share with you what we've had. The first question, do you intend to travel in the next 12 months after travel restrictions are lifted? 89% of people are yes. And in fact, that pretty much ties up with last week. 88% of people, I think, last week were in favour of travel. So great to see this is not putting off most people, certainly not the fans of, of, uh, of this sort of show anyway. So that's really, really encouraging for the industry. Most people see this as probably being an experience that we'll move on from. Question two, how would you describe your attitude to travel as a result of the coming epidemic? 47% uh, doesn't bother me at all. Now, that's actually higher than last week. 49% uh, will travel again, but will change the way I do it. And I think last week it was probably about 57, 58%. Uh, and 4% say not going anywhere, thanks. So again, most of you confirming you want to travel. And about half of you will change the way you do it. And, and that's something we can talk about uh, as we go forward on this anyway. But the other half of you not bothered at all. So that's very encouraging. And which of the following travel means would you be comfortable with taking? You can obviously choose more than one. 91% of people are more than comfortable with air travel. And again, that's slightly up to last week. I think it was 85%. 13% are happy to still go on a cruise ship. Uh, I think we only had 8% last week, so the cruise industry will be happy that they've ticked the double figures. 87% uh, land travel, 83% domestic, 72% still happy to go international. Again, very, very similar. So most of you, by the sound of things, are, uh, are sounding as though you're, you're quite happy for business as usual. I'll just end this poll, and I should be able to pop it on the screen. What I might do, because they don't give me, the, um, they don't give me a screenshot of this, so excuse me, folks, I'm going to take a photo of my screen right now, which is probably going to look very unusual, but that's okay. I'd rather see it as a graph. So done. So again, very interesting poll results in terms of that. Um, I'll just share this on the screen. Hopefully you guys can all see this now. Uh, it's just coming through. So, so yeah. I mean, and I do just want to add, add that uh, I see there's a question there, uh, sorry, a statement that um, Tracy had said that she didn't do cruising before this and won't do it afterwards. I've never been on a cruise so that's part of my curiosity aspect as well so um you know i'm sort of light-heartedly mentioning yeah i'd look for a, a cheap deal but um 
it's more just I'm I, I look at life on a whole is about having experiences that I haven't had before to know directly if I like it or would do it again or not. Um, so that's just a mindset aspect for, uh, for me. It's not that I'm wanting to throw caution to the wind as such, but uh, yeah, I know I'm going to cruise at some stage. Um, but you know, maybe the frugal side of me would jump up and go, look at that deal. I can't say no right now. And surely they've cleaned everything. Yeah. <laughs> it will be the first ones on there. <laughs> I, think I think you hit the nail on the head there again. Um, it's look at those deals. Cause I think last week there, you got, it, it came up that smaller cruise ships might become more popular because you know, the ability to keep things clean and less masses and all that big ships are still going to be fine because people as a whole, they're going to look at that price and they're going to go, I can go on that trip for that much. And I'll probably, I will probably be, I mean, heck, we know smoking isn't helpful. And I think the tobacco industry is not terribly hurting. I mean, people realize there's risks in certain activities and they still do it. The big ships, I mean, they, I'm sure they're going to get hammered for the next year or so, but they'll be back in fine in fine form and and they'll be full because people will go because people who love like, there's a comment just came up people who love to cruise will cruise and that is absolutely true like it's there's no taking it away from them i mean will we go on a cruise again probably you know that's if we can find a screamer of a deal in transatlantic when we decide to finally go back to europe good chance we'll be on it because it's a great way to travel mm. Mm. Well, these are exceptional circumstances, but it, that kind of leads into a question we had last week too, and, and probably the 50% or nearly 50% of people who are talking about they will travel, but maybe change the way they do that. Are we going to see more smaller travel groups? Uh, you know, is the 40-seater bus going to perhaps die off and be replaced by smaller groups? Are we going to see, um, you know, smaller uh, cruise ships going out as opposed to the big ships? Are people going to be forcing that to be happening? What's your guys' thoughts on, on the size of tour groups going forward? Feel free to jump in. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> I, well, like I said, I don't think the I think the big cruises will carry on just fine after a delay. The, the busing groups, I I can't speak to. We've never done one and don't really have a an interest in it, so I can't speak to what that's like. I I can speak from that part. Not only do I have a um, you know former career in that world, but um, both Nat. And I have parents who are APT, which is Australian Pacific Tours um, addicts, and they've been on all the big uh, world stuff that, you know, let's just blow 15, 20 grand for six to eight weeks, um, you know, and, and that makes me kind of go, and now I know where people think expensive because these nice stuff like if they're going to go to um the rockies in canada and do the the gold leaf hopefully my internet comes back doing the gold leaf train trip and then going and staying at lake louise and you know like everything is all top notch but these are these once in a lifetime trips um and they're retired and they saved all their life to be able to do these once in a lifetime trips so they will continue because there is a market for those tours. Um, again, referring back to the Nomadic Matt blog post, um, there is a lot of people within the Nomadic community that are really hoping, uh, more than anything, you know, hoping and praying that some of these mass tourism things will start to lighten off a little bit for the impact of, you know, the footprint. Um, sure. These huge tour groups that come out of China and Asia and, you know, even the Australian, you know, pensioners that go and hit a place and they've got their, not just one 40 seater coach, but, you know, seven of them and they all bombard on a place. And, you know, hopefully that aspect. Might've just lost Jodie there temporarily. We'll come back to you. If you do rejoin us, Jodie, if you're dropping out, maybe just cut the camera. We'll go with the sound. Um, and, and I think, okay, all right, I might do that. I'll try the camera off. That's and good. if you got me? Yep, keep going. Yep. Okay, I was just, I was just saying, I believe that with uh, Travatical and Go With Less and all of us living this lifestyle and more and more people, you know, our sphere of influence, our ripple effect um, is going to make a bigger difference, but to, particularly in this age group of, you know, Gen X and, and young baby boomers, um, it's going to be different to the age group of our parents. Um, so it's possibly going to be changing anyway. 
something because we're showing people that there are other ways to travel. It's not just in this old mindset of you use the travel agent, you book your organized tour. Um, you know, yes, it's still going to be there because we've got quite a few elderly people only wanting to travel that way. And it is that once in a lifetime experience, but hopefully this ripple effect that we're all creating and, and playing a part in um, will have that bigger impact to slow down and start to have a more kind of, um, sustainable tourism element uh, to our future travels. That's what I'm hoping anyway. It's sort of like a hope and prayer type thing. Yeah. Well, we're talking about, um, you know, the size of tour groups and, and touching on that subject of, um, you know, people changing the way they travel. I guess um, maybe something in terms of that, Amy, might be um, what, what sort of guarantees are people going to be looking for when they travel? You know, are people going to not want to book too far in advance? Are we going to see more last minute travel being booked? Are we going to see people insisting and, and the travel agents and tour companies promising uh, refunds in, in advance. What's, what's your thought on that? I think Peter's got a thought too. He'll be right behind you when you're finished. It's funny that you asked me that because as I mentioned, like we have been planned in, in January, we were planned 13 months out fully every day, 13 months out. And so Jody and Peter are like, I, I can't even remember that far back to my newbie oh. days. <laughs> so, we, so what we have learned in our journey, and it was even before COVID because we had some things shift in our house sitting uh, at the beginning of the year that had nothing to do with COVID, but it taught us a lesson right up front is stop. You don't need to plan out that far in advance. Many things can happen including the death of a homeowner things and the, or a pet, all kinds of things can happen. And the further out you plan, there's two like people, especially in the house sitting world, especially in the house sitting world. So you can plan a cruise generally a year in advance or a full resort vacation and be generally, as long as there's not a hurricane or something like you should be okay. But a house sit, there are many, many factors that can affect you taking that house sit in a year and from them moving, ch ch changing jobs. I mean, they're, they're, they just didn't take the trip they thought. So, so what we have learned is trust the trust and take the shorter notice. So I'm not sure what the, the guarantees will look like, but I know for us that it's really, sh and the COVID has really slammed this home for us. Don't plan so far in advance because too many things, like, too much changes. And I think we learned that lesson much faster than a lot of nomads because we had to. And I think we're now travel. We're now planning three to six months in the future. I think now we're planning. We're just planning June right now. Where are we going to be in June? We just booked that yesterday, and we didn't know where we were going to be. We asked our video audience, "Where should we go?" We didn't know. So yeah, so we're, we're, we're rolling with the punches and putting it all online for everyone to see us, us do it and make all of our mistakes. You rookies, I don't know. You, you're just like <laughs> us last year. We did everything all mapped out for six months. This year we started to look what everyone else is doing. Because, you know, a lot of these guys, I know you, well, Peter and the rest of you, you just go, ah, maybe next month we'll go somewhere. And I couldn't get my head around that, but now we can. And I'm glad we haven't booked too much in advance. But I guess, I mean, we've well, looked, sorry, Peter, I'll come back to you in a sec. We're fortunate oh, as digital nomads, we can move around. But I guess for a lot of the people um, listening and watching today, you know, they, if they're poor, unfortunate working people who have to book their holiday six months in advance um, to get the time off, that may be, be, may be a little bit more of an issue for them and it's not going to be quite that flexibility. So, um, sorry, Peter, I've been, I've been cutting you out there. No, 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 totally good. I, no, there's a couple awesome points there. I mean, for us in our first six years, I mean, we, well, and we still haven't, we've never used anything what we consider to be a, a kind of a weak sign, like travel insurance, cancellation insurance. We've never touched that. We, we you know, people say, oh, do you want travel cancellation insurance? It's like, why? Like, if you're going to go all in, um, I think there might, you know, for us, we may, we may consider looking that a little more closely, especially over the next two to three years as things are a little bit unsettled. Um, I mean, who knows what will come in? I saw a comment earlier, I think it was from Barbara, asking about antibodies testing. I mean, who knows, maybe we'll all have to carry a little yellow card, like for yellow fever, that, you know, to prove that you've, you've had a vaccine or whatever. Okay, well, that's fine if that happens. Um, the planning far out stuff, I, I mean, we, we don't get hung up if we don't know what we're doing next month. I mean, that's, I mean, we've been doing this several years now, and we don't get, you know, if, if things fall through or somebody gets sick or a pet dies, like all those things you said, something else will come up. It always does. And if not, eh, we'll like we'll rent a hut on a beach somewhere and kill the six weeks until we have to go somewhere else. Um, yeah, we'll go scuba diving. Um, but uh, I got to make sure I get my, my train of thought here correct. 
if we like we know for ourselves we still have a house sit booked in november of this year so we're six months out from that and we've been in communication with the homeowners and they're still good to go i mean they're they're sailors so they're going to be on a boat their own boat um so it's not for them they've got no plans to change um and what's what i find interesting is that's a five-month house sit yeah i know why would we want to spend another winter in canada but anyway that's another five-month house sit and then we're already in well, we we had some feelers out for potentially another house sit a six month house sit after that which i hope works out i mean that would be absolutely fantastic uh, it's nothing's confirmed yet it's just some inquiries but you know as much as we embrace the short-term stuff there's there's homeowners out there who plan that far ahead because their life is that far ahead they have multiple homes they've you know they live six months here six months there they need someone to watch their home because of the nature of the country they're in uh, we've had I'm that exact situation. Yeah, Peter, we had that exact situation with a UK couple who owned a home in Barbados right. that they'd been trying to sell for years. So for years they couldn't sell it. So we were lined up to go back to Barbados two years in advance, Amy. So we have actually done really advanced stuff. Yeah. Um, and then things change. You know, in that particular case, um, it was really sad. She ended up with breast cancer and she decided to go back to the UK to, to deal with that. And then suddenly the house ended up selling. So, you know, it all rolled out. Two years was totally fine with us. We didn't even know which part of the world we were going to be in. But in January, I was at a conference in Nashville and I committed to going back there next uh, March. So next March, I've already got where I want to be. And then it's a case of backtracking. So whether it be a conference or a cruise or a house sit, and you know, particularly when even for us to have been in Montreal for um, this period was because of a previous time we'd been um, house sitting in Quebec. And this lady's whole life totally turned upside down and when she got in touch with us and said can you come back that was about a year in advance it was literally this time last year when when everyone was saying to me where are you going to be for your 50th birthday and i'm like i don't know i've got the whole pick of the world where am i going to be and then i get this email saying will you please come back her husband her husband's passed away um she's moved to a little condo now and our hearts just went like we have to go and help her out like we got to go there so it looks like i'm turning 50 in quebec and you know it was like we we say yes to things in advance that just feel right you know like i know i've got to be in nashville in march next year so i'll backtrack and feel from there i can only be in the states for, for 90 days so is it going to be 90 days in advance of when i've got to be there or behind or so yeah it's just kind of like that always working stuff out that, yep. that's the fun part of house sitting is you get that one that great house sit way in advance and then it's like okay where are we going to be in the meantime and it, that's the exciting part. That's what's so great about this lifestyle. I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't understand when people find that stressful. I just, and it makes me just giggle. Just like, just like Peter had said about the cancellation, we have never opted in for cancellation no. insurance, whatever else, <laughs> until leaving Canada in March. We paid our $44 to go, <laughs> just in case we can't get to Mexico, we paid our $44 cancellation fee. Of course, didn't need it. <laughs> yeah, of course not. <laughs> because you paid it. <laughs> That's your fault. Not Amy's fault, it's your fault. We thought it was. <laughs> but um, you're right. I mean, we tend to fit, you know, we, we will lock in the house sits for the year kind of and then fit everything else around it. And that's the easiest way because, as you say, house sitters do want to know what's happening some time out. You know, some of them are advertising six months or more in advance um, because they are trying to work to that schedule. So uh, it is important to be flexible. But we'll just come back to this question from Barbara that you, uh, you touched on um, uh, just before, Peter. Uh, will testing for antibodies affect travel in other countries? Um, I, I might jump in first on that. I think it's going to depend on a country by country basis, but there's certainly talk of it. Um, I guess my question with that might be, uh, I've heard that maybe the antibodies last perhaps two years. I mean, again, that may not be, be proven. How often are you going to have to get this done? Are you going to have to carry the equivalent of a passport around or include it in your passport? Or how do, the, how do you see that maybe panning out? Um, Amy, I'll, I'll chuck that at you for a start. I don't know if you've given that any consideration. We have, but I mean, this is just a, a complete guess of, I mean, so that we know too little is the problem. So we don't know about recurrence. We don't know. So I, I think, I think that question is too, way too premature to even guess on right now is, is where I am. It, it, it's so premature. So do we think about it? Yes. 
Yeah, and I, we're extremely interested in having antibody testing because, again, we have some hunch that we've already had this. Many people have already had this, but the antibody testing isn't, isn't extraordinarily accurate. It's not easily available. So for now, we're just trying to understand, like, can, like what's, what's it look like just to even get antibody testing is really where, we're, where our focus is, I think. And then what does that mean to our travel life and, and requirements for countries where we may be entering? I think, that's, I think my head isn't at that point yet. Okay. Jodie, what's your thoughts? Um, it's an interesting one for me because I definitely come from more of a mindset. I'm completely uneducated on it, but my, my gut instinct is a little bit against kind of anything to do with, you know, shots and, and um, immunizations and all that kind of aspect. But my lifestyle I'm in my eighth year of doing this and I don't want to stop anytime soon. So if it means that I have to have some sort of shot and some sort of test to keep my lifestyle, absolutely. I'm hundred percent on board. Um, but with regards to, um, I guess it, let's say different countries saying you can't come in unless you have this, this or this, uh, the information to get that updated is I believe going to be more of the problem than like, we're not going to be able to just trust a website or a blog post or this or that. It's going to be like an experiential thing. It's going to be step by step as, long, as we go. But what will happen, what I truly believe will happen is that it will be almost blocked upon departure as opposed to entry. So let's say we do all the research in the world. And if I want to get to Columbia, um, you know, in September or in October and everything I've looked at and whatever else, and I can't find that there's any restrictions for me to get there. I get to the airport and they say, oh, Columbia, the, the airlines just noticed, um, just notified us that you can't get into the country unless you've got your yellow card. Yeah. And it'll be like, but I'm flying in the next hour. Like, what do I do? So I feel that that's probably more of a possibility, like just in this interim period, like Amy says, until it becomes... You know, more well known, more whatever. Um, because, and, and even just the rules that are changing in a heartbeat in every country anyway, you know, like everything is just changing. Like suddenly I went to, to Walmart here and couldn't buy alcohol. It was like, whoa. Oh, that's, that's not on. Was there, a, <laughs> was there a notice happening? Did I miss something? But yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Peter, Peter, I've noticed every time you pick that glass up, it's actually full of the when you last put it down. Don't think I haven't seen that. You know what? You know what the key is to ha successful travel is ha having a partner that has always got your back. Uh, the, the work that goes on behind the scenes is so important. Yeah. No, well, that's a good point you raised, Jody. I, I think maybe they will push it back on the airlines to make sure before you leave that you are, you know, doing it. Otherwise, their owners will be on flying you home again, and they won't want to be doing that. So, you're right. It might be a departure situation, and that may not be a bad thing if you keep leaving from one country, your home country, and you know the rules. Just get it done. You know, you're not going to be skipping around the world wondering what response you'll get in, in different places. So uh, that might actually uh, work out to be a plus for that. It, I mean, it's it's going to be the same as it is with visas now. I and I think uh, you hit on a huge point there. The in the interim, though, I don't know about you guys, but we have had a couple of times where the communication between the country and the airline and the poor buddy sitting behind the desk that's saying you can't come in or you can't get on your plane right now is not always seamless, is the, I guess I'll put that as, as politely as I can. And you are stuck, you know, can you just stand over there for a moment, please? And, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes later, you get an answer. For us, we've been fortunate every time it's been positive, but we have, we have had situations where, you know, there's been minor rule changes that have kind of caused a hiccup. I could see that happening a lot more in the next, in the next year, for sure, as, as countries, I mean, they're, they're struggling to do their best. There's no ill intent by any of them, and certainly not by the poor buddy who's sitting behind the desk. Um, but it's going to happen for sure, I think, where people are going to go, well, the rules, you know, the government's just said this. And I, I suppose that's why maybe cancellation insurance may be more popular in the next 12 months. We'll, yeah. we'll stop again after 18 months because who wants that stuff? I see, Beverly. Tony, as you mentioned, Sorry, I was just because I see oh, Beverly as you mentioned, said, uh, oh no, I'm assuming Beverly is saying oh no to the absence of alcohol at Walmart, not oh no to having a COVID passport. So. <laughs> Sorry, Amy. But where you mentioned, uh, like, so if you're back and forth to the same country, 
So it depends on the kind of traveler you are. So if you're a normal kind of a traveler who goes on a, a few week holiday a year, that you're going to maybe understand your 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 own immigration. Yeah. And but when you're nomad and place to place to place, and you're never going from one place to the same place ever, that's a new tech. That, that's something that's new. So where where each country is going to have their own rules. Um, what do you do when you're leaving a country that isn't your home country and, and you're going into a country that isn't your home country? This is all new, new. And I think it's just it's, the time is going to have yep. to unfold for us to, to understand more. And it's probably going to be quite confusing even after things are set. Jody? If I can add an, a live experience of that from, it was either 2015 or 2016. And it just makes me really, you know, hone in on the fact that these communities, you know, the like, subscribing to Amy and Tim and subscribing to Travatical and following the blogs and staying parts of communities is the way that you learn this stuff. So that exact thing that Peter was talking about happened to us leaving the UK to come to the States and after the States, we were going to Barbados. Now we knew that the United States seems to think they have ownership over Canada and Mexico. So when you leave in the UK, they have all the airlines are told do not let somebody on the plane unless you can see they're on forwarding where they're going to next so we knew we couldn't say we were going to to canada we couldn't say we were going to mexico because that's not leaving the states apparently but we figured that going to a fellow commonwealth country called barbados would be fine now we were literally checking in at norwegian airlines and the, the girl said but your Barbados flight isn't on for You need to be showing that you're going home or you leave in the area or whatever. And we're like, when did this happen? And it literally would have been a case of a memo would have come in saying Department of Homeland Security has pointed out that on page 59 in section 3.2, any on-forwarding um, country now includes the 28 island nations of the Caribbean as well as Canada and Mexico. And we're like, well, when did that come about? You know, like, what the hell? But thankfully, standing at that gate and knowing that we couldn't not afford to take that flight, we knew how to book an on-forwarding flight online for $10, just quickly buy a yep. on-forwarding ticket. And we had us yep. flying back to Australia or back to Germany or wherever it was that we got a ticket. And it was very hair raising because we had to wait, wait, wait. We're like, come through, come through, come through. We've got to get this because we've got to check in. But it came through. But if we hadn't have been part of this overall community, we wouldn't have even known that we could get an onboarding ticket and make that flight. So it's really important to stay a part of the community and follow, you know, follow everyone's blogs and magazines and YouTube channels to stay up to date with this sort of information because yeah. that kind of Johnny on the spot situation is going to happen again, just as we've been talking about. Yeah, we, we have successfully used that very same service and it is fantastic and it works like a charm. Like it's yeah, fully, fully endorsed that one. That's, that's a great service. Yeah. No, there's some wonderful information out there with a lot of travel bloggers. You guys, obviously, with the information you have. Um, and just reminded everybody in terms of the websites, go with less. Uh, Tim and Amy's uh, website, check out the YouTube videos where a lot of their information is. Uh, you'll find Jody and Nat's information at natandjody.com and uh, Peter and Karen Pexon's at pexon.com. And uh, Peter's photos are worth checking out in themselves. He doesn't drink all the time. He can keep a straight lens when he needs to. So uh, some of them do look quite good. Just a question. And from... you should put the, we, we need to put the Travatical link in here as well, because you're, you guys are new to the, the scene. Like we need to get Travatical out there. Well, well. We're old, but new. We've reinvented ourselves. So we were the expatchat.com. Some of you will know our podcast from back in 2015, 2016. Uh, so we do have a big following with the podcast, but we're now rebranding as Travatical and focusing mainly on the over 50s. So um, we'll mention that at the end. Thank you, Jody. Thank you for leading into that one. Um, a question from Rob, do you see places like Europe reopening border control from one country to another, even within Schengen? Um, I think there's a little bit of a talk. I, I haven't followed it too closely. Um, there was a little bit of talk about that. I would have thought Europe would be the first place that would open, but obviously at the moment they're all very much acting like separate countries and uh, they've been certainly very hard hit in a few of those countries. Uh, what do you guys uh, think in terms of that? Well, I spent um, a number of months last year in Belgium and France. 
it says my internet's in connected. Sorry, I'll turn my video off again. So I spent a number of months in Belgium and France last year, and um, there was definitely kind of a bit of a hum or a buzz during all the Brexit talk that quite possibly there are a few countries that would like to um, bring their borders back. Um, that could still just be rumour type stuff. We, of course, sitting there with a 90-day Schengen visa are going, please, please, just at least the countries we'd love to go to because we'd like to be able to stay longer than three months. Um, but who knows? I mean, yeah. this, this could be the tipping point. It, who knows? Um, it's going to be something, I think, well worth watching because uh, for those of us who, don't, who aren't lucky enough or even for the UK passport holders that might eventually not be able to travel Europe as freely as they used to as well. Um, there is many of us who would love to be able to spend more time in Europe than just 90 days out of 180. Uh, so if it happens, I'm actually okay with it. I think we're seeing a bit of an increase in nationalism going on um, with this COVID situation, which is unfortunate. We've seen a lot of that really building up over the last few years. And uh, what's uh, your thoughts on it, Amy? I know you spent a lot of time in Europe. Um, do you think maybe some of the European countries are going to want to um, go back into their shells a little bit more going forward? Potentially, I mean, we see what's happening with Hungary. So we visited two years ago and for too short of a trip and couldn't wait to go back. So as you mentioned, the nationalism, I mean, we look at that with great concern, the political situation around the world. So, and it's in many places, including in our own country. So, um, so I would, Jody says though, if we are able to stay any, we love Europe. And if we're able to stay in Europe any longer than the Schengen issues, we would take full advantage of that as soon as possible. Yep. So. So it would be, I mean, it's not great for European uh, EU citizens, but, uh, but for non-EU citizens, it, it's, it, would be, it would be great, sure. potentially. Yep. Okay. That's huge. Uh, I, the reason we, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Peter, sorry. I was just going to say, the region, reason we've spent so much time in Central America, Australia, and, and uh, Asia, is that we didn't want to go to Australia when we first started our travels. Oh, sorry, we got to go to uh, Europe when we started our travels because we were fearful we would never leave. And we, we'd been there previously <laughs> and we love it. Yeah, um, us too. So, yeah, we, we figured, you know what, we'll take six to 10 years to go other places and then we'll kind of shift our attention to Europe and hopefully spend six to 10 years there. And then, well, yeah, the Schengen. Uh, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't be terribly upset if that was less stringent. You, you may not want to leave, Peter, but I can guarantee somebody will want to kick you out at some point, so don't worry about that. Oh, come <laughs> on, they just have to have a drink with me. We'll be fine. I and then you have the affordability of other places around the world, and that's quite appealing. That's true. Yes, that's true. Um, if there's any more questions, guys, just put them in the chat box. But um, if there's no further, we'll just wind up with maybe one last question, uh, and that's probably around destinations, um, whether you guys see there being a change in the popularity of certain places. We've seen... Um, the major tourist hubs like, you know, Venice, Barcelona, Dubrovnik, they've just been inundated more and more over the last few years. Uh, now, you know, they're obviously a dead quiet. Are people going to be maybe steering away from some of those sort of places because of the crowds? Are we going to see other places perhaps come in and become more popular? And, and if so, what ones would be your picks? Hey. It could go a lot of different ways. So imagine if you've been yeah. wanting to go to Paris your whole life and that was on your bucket list and now this happened and maybe you're 65 years old. Maybe you're going to say, I'm going to get my butt to Paris before I can't get my butt to Paris any longer yeah. or anywhere else in the world. And so th I think this is th this worldwide phenomenon, I think is, is maybe going to have people really re-examine their, their bucket list really carefully because especially where we're going to have maybe have years of kind of funky travel that once things are safer, I think people, I don't know that it's going to be as sensitive. I think, I think there's going to be a lot of that bucket list travel happening for good reason. Peter? I, I, I just don't know. Like the, the whole bucket list thing for me, I'm living my bucket list. So I, I, I don't, I don't view it as I got to go here to do the bucket list or there to go to the bucket list. I'm in the bucket right now, and it's it's awesome. Um, this this whole COVID thing. I mean, I, I appreciate the seriousness of it and all that, but without trivializing the trauma of it, it's one more adventure, and it will pass. And other adventures will come up in the future. Maybe not quite as disruptive. Um, where we will go, or where people will choose to go, I don't have that magic ball. I just I don't know. I, know I, I have a feeling. <laughs> I have a feeling that 
places um, say you, you mentioned Croatia, which is sort of perfect because those bordering countries of Montenegro, Albania, uh, they're not by any means last frontier, but from that traveler's mindset, stop the video again, let me turn the video off. From that traveler's mindset, it's the places that they want to go to have the similar experiences to avoid the crowds. So those kind of neighboring type places or the little bit outside are always going to um, be appealing, I think, anywhere, you know, and now that the world is so much more connected with the internet, we get to learn and read about this stuff as well. Uh, and I just wanted to answer that. I see there was a question that Janine had put in asking about the Australian um, bilateral agreements for the ex extra time in Europe. Um, I, just to give everyone an update, I did call upon that, um, or Nat and I called upon that uh, just last year. So Australia has a bilateral agreement with Belgium and we were in Europe for longer than 90 days. And we used the 1953 or something think uh, print out of that original bilateral agreement direct with Belgium and it worked for us. Um, we left a little bit of confusion with the young fellow who uh, you know did sort of our immigration officer but we also did a lot of um, preparation for it. We didn't we, we chose to fly out of a small um, regional airport rather than a major city. Um, the flight was at night it was late at night and there was I don't know there was probably only 20 people catching this plane. So there was no congestion, no space, no stress. I think these guys were literally just waiting for everyone to get through so they could go home. So we kind of had thought about all that aspect, um, but we did use our bilateral agreement and it was fine. We didn't have any issues with um, staying longer in Europe. But every country needs to do their own research on that part of it. Um, but yeah, as for new destination, not new destinations, uh, to me, the best part and why we have been full-time house sitters for as long as we have is because it has opened our eyes to places that we would never have normally put on our so-called bucket list or on our, you know, awareness factor of where we would like to go. Um, we've been in some incredible places that we just keep thinking as we see those listings come up in future. And even that's another conversation, which we probably don't have time for. Maybe next time you do your next chat, uh, chat Tony. But will the houses continue on as well? Um, you know, obviously, I believe they will. But I believe that maybe this first stage of this COVID aspect might be a little bit more of home exchange because at least homeowners can be in more control uh, of being able to, say, meeting somebody else in another part of the world, being able to say, like, hey, we've got our own levels of cleanliness. Can we both make sure that we do all these things to make sure our homes are ready so that we could swap homes? Um, but I believe that home exchange has always been a great kickoff point to house sitting again. And, um, yeah. Uh, I think there's always going to be house sits, but... Uh, I think we just lost Jody there. The, yeah, I think with house sitting, supply and demand is going to be an interesting issue with that. Just to clarify um, what Jody's talking about with bilateral agreements for you guys who aren't clear, there's rules obviously with Schengen as to how long you can spend within Europe, uh, being a three month period with three months to leave. But aside from that, there are often long standing direct agreements between nations themselves. For example, as Jody's saying, between Australia and uh, I think it was Belgium, she said. Uh, there's a long-standing agreement that allows Australians to be in Belgium. So that can supersede what goes on with Schengen and can buy you more space. Uh, the same applies for New Zealand. It will probably apply for the US as well. Um, there's just a comment here from Paul Riken, who's a Kiwi, uh, saying that he's taken advantage of that with Germany. He had his three months in Europe under Schengen, uh, but was then able to go into Germany for another two months um, per that long-standing bilateral agreement that New Zealand and Germany have. So something for you to check out, you're not restricted to just the three months of Schengen. You may be able to duck into one particular country where there is an agreement between uh, your passport nation and that other country and stay on for longer as, as Paul has done, as Jody has mentioned as well. So don't always assume that three months is, is your limit uh, in Europe. Check out what, what agreements there are with individual European countries and you may be able to extend that or hole up somewhere until your three months can, uh, can restart. So. Uh, Guys, look, thank you. Uh, it's been very, very informative. Um, we could literally talk about this for ages, but we won't today, because uh, there's a considerable amount to, uh, to cover for that. I want to thank our panelists for joining us uh, today. Amy Rutherford, uh, Tim and Amy Rutherford from gowithless.com. Do check out their website and also their YouTube. 
to Peter and Karen Pexham, thank you. Pexham.com is the website to check out uh, their blog uh, for their information. And uh, of course, thank you also to Jody coming to us from Mexico, uh, along with her wife, uh, Nat Smith. Natandjody.com is their website. These guys have some fantastic information. Somebody's trying to get into the door. I'm doing a webinar. Uh, so um, somebody is, um, sorry, where was I there? Natandjody.com is the website there. These guys have some wonderful resources and some wonderful information um, which can be shared. So I do all, uh, urge you to check them out. Uh, I'm Tony Argo from Trevatical.com. Uh, you can check out a recording of this on YouTube in the next couple of days. We'll also put it up in our, our website area at Trevatical.com forward slash interviews. Uh, but thank you, panelists. Much appreciated for you all. Thank you for everyone who's attended today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys again in the near future. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much for organizing it. Thanks so much. See you again soon. See you guys. <laughs>